Sup, Chooms, how y'all living? Hope everything is Nova and you're all having a preem week. So, I am sure by now that anyone who trawls for information across the various hair loss forums and subreddits on the interwebs has come across this news about keratin microspheres for hair loss. We see this kind of hype for theoretical hair loss treatments come and go all the time on all the various hair loss forums and subreddits, and most of the time, the news isn't even worth its weight in broccoli. However, it's not just Trustless that is hyping up keratin microspheres this time. There's been a lot of coverage of this treatment even on popular science websites as well. So, being that I am of course a hair loss witcher, I am always interested in pipeline treatments even if 99% of the time they end up as being completely worthless. But who knows, maybe this one has some actual legitimate potential. So let's go ahead and take a look at this article. Here it is. Oh, wait a minute. Damn. It looks like the article is protected by some sort of magical paywall. All right, give me a second, hair loss switchers. I think I'm going to have to consult a professional here. Okay, are you sure about that? You sure that's not too dangerous? You sure you're not putting my viewers at risk? Okay, well, I'm not as experienced as you are, but I'm willing to give it a shot. So... Geralt of Rivia himself has advised me that in order to dispel this paywall, I am going to have to use the Yurden sign as well as toss a Dimeridium bomb at it. So, let's go ahead and try it. Give me a second. Now! And poof! There we are! My Witcher mutations and alchemy skills prevail yet again. So here is the full article. It's titled, quote, Keratin microspheres as promising tools for targeting follicular growth, unquote. It's from Japan, which is home to the Science Patrol and Ultraman. So, what the researchers in the study were trying to do was develop a kind of nanoparticle that would penetrate the skin barrier in order to deliver hair loss drugs directly to the hair follicles and thus make them much more effective. So... To explain the anatomy of the skin, first of all, the outermost layer of the skin is made up of dead skin cells, and it is called the stratum corneum. This is actually a pretty solid barrier that is pretty impenetrable to most liquids. That's why topical minoxidil has such a high concentration of the drug. 5% topical minoxidil contains a whopping 50 milligrams of minoxidil in a milliliter, but it's estimated that only 1-2% to 2 of this makes it through the skin barrier to reach the hair follicles. The reason why minoxidil is dissolved in a mixture of propylene glycol ethanol, and water is because these solvents penetrate the skin much better than just water alone. But besides just penetrating the stratum corneum, there is another route to the hair follicles, and that is through the pores created by the hair follicles themselves. Studies have shown that about half of the minoxidil applied to the skin penetrates through the stratum corneum, through the pores created by the hair follicles, and by the sebaceous glands in the skin. Anyways, it turns out that very tiny particles of drugs can penetrate the pores of the hair follicles and improve the delivery of hair loss medications by delivering them directly to the hair follicles. So, researchers have been working on different kinds of nanoparticles that can go through these tiny holes in the stratum corneum and deliver their payloads directly to the hair follicles. There are a number of nanoparticle systems under development or even marketed for topical dutasteride. Compared to minoxidil and finasteride, dutasteride is a much larger molecule. It has a molecular weight of 528 grams per mole. Finasteride, on the other hand, is 372 grams per mole, and minoxidil is just 209 grams per mole. So, because of this, dutasteride has a harder time penetrating the skin barrier, which is why topical dutasteride isn't really a proven product yet. I'm not saying it is completely bunk, and I know some people have claimed to use it with success, but as it stands today, there isn't much research on the efficacy of topical dutasteride, and it is suspected that this is because the molecular weight of the drug limits its penetration through the skin. Some doctors have tried to get around this limitation by directly injecting dutasteride under the skin, which is what's called dutasteride mesotherapy. But even that method of administration hasn't proven to be very effective, and I made a video specifically on dutasteride mesotherapy, which I'll link below. So, this is all just to provide you chooms with some background information as to why researchers from Japan did this study on keratin microspheres. They were trying to develop a kind of nanoparticle that could easily deliver drugs into the skin by entering the pores of the hair follicles and bypassing the stratum corneum. This could potentially make all topical hair loss drugs more effective, not just topical dutasteride, but 
all topicals, including topical finasteride and topical minoxidil. The investigators decide to try to make these microspheres out of keratin. Keratin is a very important skin protein that gets a lot less attention than proteins like collagen and elastin, but it's actually very, very important. Keratin makes up 30% of the proteins of the skin, and it makes up 90% of the protein in each hair shaft. Keratin has been shown in some studies to help with wound healing, so the researchers felt that it was possible that by using keratin to create nanoparticles, it might have some therapeutic benefits over other types of nanoparticles, like lipid nanoparticles that have been used in other studies. So, the investigators first developed a method to create keratin microspheres. Here is a picture of them. They are only 2 to 8 microns in diameter. When they are put in water, they swell up to about 23 microns in diameter and form a gel. So, you can kind of imagine them as being like sponges that swell up when they're exposed to water. After the investigators tweaked the formula for creating the microspheres, they found that the microspheres could last from one to two months if they are kept chilled. So, after developing these keratin microspheres, the investigators did a series of tests with them on mice and on cultured hair follicle dermal papilla cells. First, they did some experiments that showed that the microspheres were completely non-toxic, so that's great news, Jones. The next thing the investigators did was to see if the keratin microspheres spheres had any effect on hair growth by themselves, either positive or negative. So what the investigators did was they used a very specific type of mouse called a C57BL-6 mouse that has a very predictable hair growth cycle. The hair growth cycle in these mice is synchronized, unlike the human hair growth cycle, which is random. So at seven weeks of age, all the hair in these mice is in the telogen resting phase. So at six weeks of age, the hair on the backs of these mice was shaved and then completely removed with a hair removal cream. The mice were then divided into four groups. The first group was the control group that got no treatment. The second group was treated with 1% minoxidil that was applied daily. The third group got 1% keratin powder dissolved in water that was applied daily. And the fourth group got the 1% keratin microsphere gel applied daily. The mice were followed for 20 days and photographs were taken during treatment. This figure shows the results. If you look at day one, all the mice are shaved and so they got no hair on their backs. If you look at day 20, all the mice have regrown their hair. However, halfway through the study, at day 10, the control mice have just some pretty patchy regrowth as you can see here. The mice who just got 1% keratin dissolved in the water have much better regrowth than the control mice, though it is still pretty patchy. The group that got the 1% keratin microsphere shows even better regrowth though, but I have to admit that the best group looks like the 1% minoxidil group. The investigators noted that the regrowth started about the same time time in both the keratin microsphere group and the 1% minoxidil group and that the growth in the keratin microsphere group was comparable to the growth with minoxidil. They say, quote, this promotion was comparable to the effect observed when using an aqueous solution of the positive control minoxidil, the FDA-approved drug for hair loss, unquote. The investigators felt that the results indicated that, like minoxidil, keratin microspheres shorten the telogen resting phase of the hair cycle and induce the angen growth phase. They say, quote, Indeed, the data strongly suggests that keratin microsphere treatment induced rapid initiation of the angen phase of the hair cycle, unquote. So, this was kind of a surprising result. The investigators then tested the microspheres in a culture of dermal papal cells and then analyzed what was going on biochemically and looked at genes that were upregulated and downregulated by the keratin microspheres. It turns out that there were lots of effects seen from these keratin microspheres on the cellular mechanisms. I'll just summarize what they found. Most of the genes upregulated had to do with skin structures and the hair follicle development, while genes that were downregulated had to do with skin aging, cell apoptosis, which has to do with cell death, cell stickiness, and inflammation. Decreasing cell stickiness might have actually led to better absorption of the microspheres by opening up gaps between the cells. In addition, a number of cell signaling pathways were affected, such as the WNT Wnt pathway and the SHH, otherwise known as the Sonic Hedgehog pathway. Way. And there were other pathways as well. These pathways are all known to induce the antigen growth phase of the hair follicle, so that's good. Also, growth factors like VEGF were activated, while negative growth factors like TGF beta were decreased. So, the study goes into a lot of detail on all of this, but the bottom line here, Chooms, is that the keratin microspheres activate factors that lead to hair growth and inhibit factors that inhibit hair growth. So, I'll go ahead and read the study conclusion. Quote, 
In the study, we have presented findings on the impact and molecular mechanism of microsphere keratin in promoting hair growth in C57BL6 mice and human dermal papilla cells. The keratin microsphere system has the potential to advance drug delivery methods and find application in skin and hair related research and disorders. However, further in depth investigation is needed to explore the specific ways in which microsphere keratin can serve as a targeted drug delivery system and drug carrier for treating diseases with a follicular origin, unquote. So what's my take on all of this? Well, remember, this is just a mouse study we're talking about here, Chooms. Mouse skin, it has different layers and a different thickness from human skin, so we're going to need some solid human data in order to better verify the outcomes in the mouse studies to see if they're applicable to human beings. Also, the researchers used just 1% minoxidil, and even that looks like it was better than the keratin microspheres. In humans, we know that 5% minoxidil is more effective than 2% minoxidil, and nobody ever uses 1% minoxidil as far as I know. So as a growth stimulant, keratin microspheres are definitely not going to replace minoxidil, which pretty much everyone uses at a 5% solution nowadays, even women. So I'm not that impressed by the hair growth stimulating properties of keratin microspheres, which seem to be pretty minimal. What makes keratin microspheres far more interesting and potentially useful, though, is their potential to be an effective delivery vehicle for topical hair loss drugs. And that is what makes keratin microspheres worth keeping an eye on, as opposed to its minimal hair hair growth stimulating properties. From the method section of the study, it looks like that these keratin microspheres can be manufactured pretty simply and cheaply, so prices shouldn't be too exorbitant. They also seem to be easier to make than some other type of nanoparticles. So if they also have some minor benefit in stimulating hair growth, then that is just an added bonus over something like lipid-based nanoparticles. I'd be interested in seeing if these keratin microspheres filled with minoxidil, finasteride, or dutasteride would show better efficacy over the current topical preparation for these drugs. Like I've said before, dutasteride, because of its high molecular weight, is more of a challenge to deliver topically, so I'd be very interested in seeing how effective keratin microspheres filled with dutasteride would be for users of the drug. It's also possible that these microspheres could be used to deliver topical antiandrogens like pyrolutamide. Maybe that would improve pyrolutamide's effectiveness and make it the type of hair loss treatment we all hoped it would be a couple of years ago. It can also possibly potentiate future topical treatments like GT 20029 to make them even more effective. So I'm optimistic about this, but it's going to take more research to find out just how useful this treatment really is. I think keratin microspheres are an interesting new drug delivery system, but they are not going to be very useful on their own until they are filled with more effective drugs. On their own, they are not going to be very useful due to being vastly inferior to widely available and inexpensive hair growth stimulants like 5% topical minoxidil. So the bottom line here is that I do think keratin microspheres are a promising product, but only because of how they can be used to further enhance existing topical treatments. By itself, it's next to useless, but if it can do things like make topical dutasteride a viable treatment or make it so that more people can benefit from topical minoxidil, then that's fantastic and definitely something the hair loss community can celebrate. So this was a short video, and I know there have been other videos that have been in higher demand than this one, and I want to assure all of you hair loss witchers, I am definitely working on them. I have major videos coming out this month. One is on dupa and retrograde alopecia, and the other one is on the frequent questions I get as to whether chronic stress causes telogen effluvium and whether that accelerates androgenic alopecia. And believe me when I tell you, there is a ton of bullshit about that subject that needs to be scientifically dismantled as soon as possible, and I think I probably know who's responsible for spreading that bullshit. But anyways, that video is definitely high on my priority list. So I'll be back with more content in the near future. So until then, thank you for watching Hair Loss Witchers. God bless.